Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. Today we have on a very special guest for her second appearance, Caitlin Long. She's the founder and CEO of Custodia Bank. Caitlin, welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. Absolutely. Uh, our last episode did tremendously. The viewers really love the insight that you had. Uh, at that time, it was uh, revolving around paper, Bitcoin, and GBTC. Uh, and today, we're going to chat a little bit about uh, crypto fraud. Now, you released a piece that did uh, very well all over Twitter. Uh, it was blowing up uh, called Shame on Washington, D.C. for shooting a messenger who warned of crypto debacle. And so, Talk to us a little bit about what this piece was all about. Um, you know, why are crackdowns coming now rather than preemptively, uh, as you <laughs> and the several other uh, people and, and proponents over the years have avidly warned regulators about? Why are crackdowns coming uh, ex post, per se, rather than before the fact? Well, this so often ha happens in government. Um, we saw it, by the way, in the Madoff fraud as well. Uh, in that case, there were there was an entire book uh, written and a lot of literally a lot of, of news stories as well about how there were people trying to warn law enforcement, including the SEC, that something was wrong in the Madoff situation. And, and the SEC, I think, in that case, as I recall, went in and did two investigations and didn't find anything. So. I mean, it, it's it's not unusual that the crackdown happens after the fact. It's as the as the Washington uh, saying goes, "Never let a good crisis go to waste," right? And so, um, oftentimes, what happens is you see bureaucratic power grabs um, in the face of debacles like this. And boy, are we seeing that now with the different agencies, certainly with the SEC trying to get out front. Absolutely, and to the untrained eye. It seems almost like this was the plan from the get-go. I mean, throughout the years, uh, you've had um, uh, several officials come out and be relatively outspoken, uh, you know, opining about the dangers of these uh, instruments and these firms that were allowing them to proliferate, but never really doing much about it. Um, and only in the aftermath of all of this catastrophe, where you know fraud was really reached its boiling point and it led to all of this uh, fallout, yeah. which fell into the consumers' laps. Only then is there action. You know, to the untrained eye, this seems like it was the plan all along. Uh, I don't see any evidence of that. I, I understand how there are breadcrumbs that could be used to draw inferences, but I think that's giving the agencies too much credit. Um, it, you know, I think candidly, most of them were on the sidelines. They could have done more, uh, but they didn't because they didn't want to be accused of standing in the way of innovation. Um, and 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 to be honest, also here's the other real reason. They weren't sure that they had regulatory jurisdiction to do it. And now what they've done is going is they've gone ahead and grabbed that regulatory jurisdiction for themselves, even throwing caution to the wind, to use a phrase from an insider who um, in D.C. It's amazing how many people have come forward and, you know, shared shared insights with us as to what's happened. D.C. is a sieve. And it's given us some sense of, of, of what's happened here. But they know full well that some of the things that they're doing will not stand up to court scrutiny and are expecting that they're, they're just expecting, you know, the industry to sue and to challenge it. And um, I am aware that there are multiple lawsuits in the works. Fantastic. Never let a crisis go to waste. That is certainly a good crisis. A good right? crisis go to waste. We're, <laughs> yeah. we're watching that play out before us, uh, in, yeah. before our very eyes. So you start the article off uh, with before 1940, investing in mutual funds was like wading into a cesspool. That's a fantastic sentence. Um, you've publicly been a champion for several years now against excessive leverage in crypto. Um, there yeah. is the now uh, notorious clip of yourself on stage with Sam Bankman Fried saying, A fool and his leveraged Bitcoin are soon parted. Um, and in your recent piece, you've been, uh, you've revealed that you've been warning regulators now for several years about this. Now, in the 30s, uh, the mutual fund industry was, you know, just breaking into the mainstream. It was relatively new, relatively nascent. Um, talk to us about how the mutual fund industry was cleaned up during the 1930s, uh, specifically the work of Paul Cabot. Uh, and how does that work that, that occurred during the 1930s to work with regulators, clean up the industry, parallel to work today uh, uh, from yourself and from others who were trying to get in the room with these regulatory authorities and properly regulate uh, crypto and, and regulate away crypto fraud? 
Well, uh, first of all, I wasn't aware of the degree of fraud in the mutual fund industry back in the 1930s. And I have to thank uh, their two descendants of Paul Cabot, who is the founder of State Street, who are shareholders of Custodia, who reached out and explained that uh, there was a parallel and they saw the parallel to their relatives work um, in what I was doing. And I'm so honored and grateful. And I didn't fully understand the story. And I bought the book and started perusing it. And wow, uh, there are very strong parallels. Um, this was uh, this this was back in the 1930s, uh, you know, just a freewheeling um, scammers, uh, corrupt criminals, grifters, you know, trying to steal people's money. And we've seen that in spades in this sector. And I, I do not consider myself part of the crypto sector that includes those people. Um, I consider myself a Bitcoiner who is interested in the broader applications of the technology, but n certainly not applications of the technology that invade people's property rights. All the theft and crime and leverage that has been applied um, it, it just it just is the antithesis of of a basic approach of property rights, which is what is so powerful in this technology. So, yeah, it, it's um, uh, I am I, grateful that they brought this forward. Uh, their their relative, Paul Cabot, was a Boston Brahmin Republican and FDR was a Democrat, of course, uh, but he was a pro business Democrat, a pro innovation Democrat. He literally was the, you know, the United States is in the business of business type Democrat. And um, he, he, he brought uh, Paul Cabot into the Oval Office and they sat down and they hashed out the Investment Company Act of 1940, which is one of the bedrocks of financial regulation in the U.S. And the rest is history. The mutual fund industry is, of course, pretty much everybody who's got savings in the United States uses a mutual fund, whether it's through your 401k or whether it's uh, directly through your brokerage firm, um, most of us have saved money in that in that form. And thank goodness they didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater back then. And I hope that they that cooler heads prevail and that that happens again this time with with the the, the lawful part of the crypto industry. And I think that's the key distinction there. We've also made a similar distinction here at TBL. Uh, crypto perpetually lives in air quotes whenever we're <laughs> writing and whenever I have the chance to do air quotes when uh, I'm on a video, I, I take the chance to do that. And we've also uh, spoken about uh, don't throw Bitcoin out with the bathwater, right? Don't throw Correct. Bitcoin out with these several hundreds of thousands of imitations uh, that are really, uh, you know, in name only trying to imitate Bitcoin. They have the word coin in them, but in actual fact, right, it's it's not yours. It's not your property. It's not verifiable. Um, essentially, everything that Bitcoin solves, crypto isn't. Uh, in the vein of uh, Paul Cabot, who was able to get into the Oval Office and speak with FDR, uh, at TBL, we are optimistic that eventually, uh, as you uh, said in your piece here, that the wheat will be separated from the chaff. Um, you know, for example, Gensler stated last week, and I don't know if he is the uh, the the main primary regulatory body du jour to be dealing with, but he stated last week in so many words that everything else is a security in reference to to mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. Do you share that same optimism as you've been able to 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 speak with to deal with authorities firsthand that we're making progress here? Eventually, there will be a distinction between Bitcoin and crypto. Well, we took a big step back, no doubt, with Sam Bankman fried um, in part because he, boy, did he throw money around, which allegedly is customer money, but he threw money around Washington, D.C., and he got access. He got to meet with Gary Gensler. He got to meet with Jay Powell. I, I've been asking for those meetings, and not with Gary Gensler, but certainly with the with Fed governors and have been rebuffed at every turn. Uh, and then he, of course, was in the Biden White House, and I was never able to get in front of the president's working group. So candidly, I think that um, the, the, the agencies need to wipe the slate clean because what they were hearing from him was poisoned. And uh, it was funny. Somebody pointed out the FT story where... Sam Bankman free there was a picture of him in his you know t-shirt and shorts saying bitcoin as a payment system has failed and this was in the ft about a year ago and boy the juxtaposition of bitcoin as a payment system with the lightning network taking off mm -hmm. versus what happened to ftx in that in that ensuing year is staggering but that tells you something he wasn't interested in decentralization he was interested in controlling a new ledger system that 
he was in control of. And I think it's not known out there among the, this industry just how close Sam Bankman Freed got to getting Congress to enact a bill that would have created a self regulatory organization with FTX in control of it. So we dodged a bullet collectively in this industry because FTX blew up when it did before Congress was, in, was able to enact that self regulatory organization. I, I just dis disclosed for the first time last week that Stanford Law School, which is where his parents teach or taught, um, had a blockchain policy conference in November as FTX was blowing up. Uh, but they reached out to me last fall and said they wanted me to join the conference. Um, I've done something very similar at Wharton now for six or seven years. And Stanford is, is now uh, you know seeking out that territory. And when they said FTX was sponsoring it, I think they thought that I would consider that a positive thing. And I, when they told me that, I said, well, then I, I can't participate. Thank you. Um, and then they came back and said, oh, wow, actually, no, we're not taking money from FTX. And at that point, I said, well, then, OK, I'll participate. But it, that level of, 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 you know, behind the scenes, those of us who really understood and knew um, something was very, very wrong. And we did not want to be part of that Washington DC push. So back to your original question, I think there's been a big step backwards because they were listening to Sam Bankman-Fried who truly was interested in this for himself and not for decentralized technology. Absolutely. It seems it seems like through the 2000s there was there's been this hunger uh, at least among the Silicon Valley types for another uh, I mean, Steve Jobs walked around in jeans. He wore normal shoes. He acted like a regular guy. Um, Mark Zuckerberg came along. Bill Gates came along. Relatively same thing. Mark Zuckerberg was obviously a teenager when Facebook uh, was first founded. And I think there's been this misplaced hunger that the smartest people in the room are always the ones that are disheveled uh, you know, and dressed <laughs> like they just walked out of bed. Uh, but in this case, um, that it's it, it couldn't have been further from the truth. I think Correct. people were taking Sam Bankman Fried's appearance and his quick, sharp answers to everything and his really acerbic wit as indicative of, oh, this guy's good natured. He knows what he's talking about. But in actual fact, it was the total opposite. Well, and I think Arthur Hayes's essay, Right Kind of White Boy, that he put out in Arthur put out back in November. Um, Arthur's African American. I'm obviously not a not a male, um, and uh, you know, so Arthur and I both don't check that right kind of white boy box. But one of the things that he pointed out, which I think is very true, is that he was in the right part of the political spectrum for Washington D.C. to roll out the red carpet and for the venture capitalists who got caught up in in his scam. Uh, to to not question him. Let's face it, it mattered that his parents were both law professors at Stanford and that a lot of their colleagues were also involved in the administration, including in, in positions of power. The New York Magazine article over the weekend about Gary Gensler is very interesting. Um, and, and this gets to the, the connectivity between Gary Gensler and Caroline Ellison's father at MIT where Sam and Caroline, I think, met. Um, so this is a this is a very small, close knit group of people, and just because of his connectivity into that small, close knit group of people, uh, you know, as Arthur correctly pointed out, uh, the way the establishment works in the United States is you don't question people like that. That's I I I I don't usually like to point out differences because I appreciate all people for who they are, but that essay that that Arthur pointed out is correct that the right kind of white boy had the red carpet rolled out for him and the rest of us did not, but boy did he do a lot of damage to this industry because he wasn't real. That's perfectly said. He wasn't real. He was he was able to get a seat at the table as a function of uh, who he was, who his parents were, who he knew, who he was friends with, uh, obviously through Caroline uh, and the connections there. Uh, it, it's it's truly remarkable. He was able to get a seat at the table because of sort of these inside dealings and factors, whereas Arthur Hayes and yourself uh, have been working for, for years now, publicly outspoken, uh, and your track record has been immaculate when you're looking back uh, and, and seeing that you've, you've actually, you've warned of, of everything that's gone wrong. Um, you know, yet it's, it's still been so difficult to actually get in the room with these people. You right. mentioned, you mentioned that, um, 
you know, we've taken a big step backward. Uh, obviously, with Sam Bankman Fried sort of being the representative of, of crypto more broadly, and obviously through through proxy Bitcoin, I suppose, um, there seems to be uh, 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 we, we have to do a lot of reevaluating of what has happened so far and sort of do a lot of rebuilding, I suppose. So as a regulator, how do you properly crack down on crypto scams before they seep into the system and harm customers? Um, you know, what does that look like? Because historically, you know, they've, they've turned a blind eye to a lot of these things uh, until they become catastrophic. How do you prevent these things from occurring? So I think it's the basic approach that Wyoming took. And uh, candidly, Sam Bankman fried would have been laughed out of the state of Wyoming if he came here to try to get one of the special purpose depository institution charters. What did Wyoming do? It basically said, let's respect property rights. Very simple. Okay, so let's define crypto as property. If it's stolen, then it's theft under our crime statutes. Uh, if, uh, let's define the commercial law status of it so that the right the parties to transactions understand what the rights and obligations of the parties are. And if there's a dispute, a judge has a roadmap to determine that dispute. Who owns the, who owns the dispute of crypto? This is antithetical to those who don't believe in the, 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 in government at all, or those who in, say for the, in the Ethereum community like to say code is law. Trace Mayer, one of the original Bitcoin OGs, and I worked together early on to recognize that if this technology wasn't, as he said it, backwards compatible with the law, then the law was an attack vector on your Bitcoin. And so we had to be able to get laws that recognize the existence of Bitcoin and recognize it as property, recognize it under commercial law. And, uh, and that's what we've done. And that's what Wyoming has done. We also reimagined what a custodian could be because custody in the securities world has evolved far away from the concept of custody of a bearer instrument. Custody used to be, in fact, banking used to be very simple. It was a money warehouse. And you got a warehouse receipt when you deposited your gold into their vault. And we've gone so far away from warehouse receipts because of the just creeping greed, frankly, of, of a lot in the financial sector and just technology limitations of wanting to move away from paper into ledger systems. But we didn't have, you know, but, but computer memory was expensive and the speed of Transaction processing was very slow. Most banks only updated their books and records only once a, once a day in an overnight batch processing process, right? We've moved well away from all that. The technology has long ago solved all those problems, but we're still stuck with the old analog processes because we're still issuing securities for the most part in paper form. Um, when you register a corporation with the state of Delaware, for example, you might get a PDF back but that's really just a PDF of an analog document. There's really nothing digitized about it, right? So we're not issuing these things natively digital. And we will eventually, but right now we're still stuck with these, you know, the analog systems. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who know how to arbitrage those analog systems and, um, you know, pick people's pockets because the technology um, is, it, it, you know, the, the, the operational processes haven't caught up with what is effectively a real-time gross settlement technology. But so what does that mean for Wyoming? Um, you're, you're right now, because of the way securities are issued, you're in a debtor-creditor relationship with your broker-dealer. You're in a debtor-creditor relationship with the custodian of your 401k assets. But in Wyoming, what we decided was to re-envision by going back to first principles, what does custody look like in an ideal world? And the answer is, let's go back to a money warehouse. Let's keep the legal title of custody in a Wyoming special purpose depository institution with the customer so that in the event that the bank goes bankrupt, it's like it's the same concept as, as parking your car at a valet parking garage or as, as a coat check. That is legally what's called a bailment. You retain title to your property. You're just temporarily handing possession of it over to the safekeeper who has very limited things that they can do with it. In other words, hang up your coat, not turn around and go wear it and, you know, go out on the town and, and, and then hope that they get back in time for, before you, you want your coat back 
Or same thing with your car. They can't take it for a joy ride or let an Uber driver, you know, um, drive it around while it's parked in the garage. They can do one and only one thing, which is park the car in the garage. And that's the way bailments work. And so Wyoming actually has a second layer of protection, which is a belt and suspender, which is you legally have a bailment in your Bitcoin custody. It is close. It's the closest to the way Satoshi thought about self-custody of Bitcoin without being in self-custody. And uh, for those, uh, uh, most of you know, I'm a big proponent of not your, not your keys, not your coin. So why is it that I was working on a Bitcoin custodian? The answer is that there are a lot of owners who by law cannot self-custody. So for example, a mutual fund, we just talked about mutual funds. Mutual funds have to, by law, segregate the management of the assets from the custody of the assets. So they need a, a custodian. And if we can get a custodian that is very consumer friendly in its legal structure, then that's the way to go. And that's Wyoming. Absolutely. Wyoming seems to have done it right in that the laws are being structured such that they align with the the idea of Bitcoin being property. Um, and yes. when traditionally, you know, if you were to have a debtor creditor relationship with a, one of these, you know, pick out of a hat any any one of the hundreds of crypto uh, uh, custodians that completely fell last year, um, you know, they have full title to your assets when they're on the platform. Um, right, and, correct. And that's of course hidden in pages and pages and pages of documents that everybody scrolls. Or just fraudulently flaunted, right? As we saw in a couple of cases, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. So to wrap up here, uh, I know we have a time constraint. Thank you so much for your time, Caitlin. Uh, we really appreciate having you on as always, and we hope you'll come back. Um, how long has Custodia Bank been fighting this fight? Uh, and obviously, you mentioned that we've taken a big step back. But what do, what do viewers need to know uh, about the regulatory framework that Bitcoin uh, has currently um, and sort of the developments on that side and folding good faith institutions such as your, yourself with Custodia Bank into the regulatory window. So the, the remainder of the, the, the United States um, can benefit from the, you know, the, let's say the laws that Wyoming has structured. What are the developments on the, uh, on the regulatory side when it pertains to uh, folding Bitcoin into the regulatory window? Well, Bitcoin doesn't care about any of this, which is what is spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. And um, you, it just keeps now, trucking. I think twice, two or three times, blocks are still getting hashed onto the block. You not. bet. Absolutely. It, that's all that matters. Every 10 minutes on average, there's another block appended. And, um, you know, the price might be influenced by some of these shenanigans from, from time to time. But even that, I, I've always said that's the least interesting aspect of Bitcoin. Is it going to be as easy to, to transact from the US dollar into Bitcoin and vice versa? No, there are going to be, there have been a number of banks that have pulled back from, from serving the industry. We don't know how far this is going to go. A lot of people have asked me, the question you asked, is this, was this purposeful? A lot of others have asked me, is this an outright ban without calling it that? And the answer is, we don't know yet. We really don't have enough evidence to, to, to determine. And so everyone's still trying to figure out where the guardrails are. It's very clear that Custodia was unfortunately the tip of the spear. But we are still a valid De De Wyoming special purpose depository institution. Whether we connect into the Fed or not has more to do with whether we are ultimately able to pursue the business plan for which we were pursuing in the beginning. Um, and the answer is, if the answer is no, we can't connect into the Fed, that doesn't mean we can't connect to the U.S. dollar system through other banks. And it also doesn't mean that we can't provide the custody services as a special purpose depository institution. We absolutely can. So custody is obviously looking into pivots. Um, stay tuned. And uh, but it is we are far from done just because the Fed did what it did. And then, of course, um, it is publicly disclosed. We do have our lawsuit outstanding against the Fed. So uh, stay tuned. Absolutely. Fantastic stuff, Caitlin, as always. You know, there, there, there may be these minor setbacks, but you're doing tremendous work in every sense of the word. I think the comparison to Paul Cabot is completely valid. I think our viewers will agree. And I think years down the line from now, uh, we will look back and say the exact same thing. Uh, that you were a trailblazer in what you are working to do with Custodia Bank and, and really setting the precedent for Bitcoin to be folded into the traditional financial system. So thank you for coming on as always. Before thank we you. sign off here, uh, where can people find you? Ah, Twitter, at Caitlin Long underscore. And I am on Noster. 
Um, I'm, I'm very, very excited about what's going on on Nasser. Lots of Bitcoiners there and lots of zaps flying around the Lightning Network. It is amazing to see oh, yeah. how how uh, how integrated that platform is into a decentralized, not truly decentralized, but a, but a relay-based social media network. It's just incredible to see what's happening there. It's gotten me as excited as I was about Bitcoin when I first really uh, came across it back in 2012, 2013 and dug into it and, and it just blew my mind. And Noster is blowing my mind that same way right now. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again, Caitlin. Appreciate it.